up, buckaroos? You know what we're talking about. I don't need to explain why the day and sleep quest is big. Let's just let's just start talking about it. But before we do, um, this video is going to be a little bit different from my other theory videos. And if anything, it's actually going to be a lot closer to the travail video in the sense that I don't I don't have a solid thesis to present to you. I don't have a solid argument that I have facts and logic to back up with. I think that this quest, while it has a lot of information that is very pertinent to the story, has all the wrong, or I guess right, depending on how you look at it, information so that it doesn't quite give us any solid leads to any solid theory. The entire quest is just a collection of loose ends and the holes that are just waiting to be filled in. And because of this, and the fact that we basically have a bunch of connecting links that are just waiting to fall into place with the Force of a Thousand Suns, I just can't present a solid theory. However, what I can do is break down this quest and do what I did with the Travail trailer and break down literally every facet of what Dane says. And I'm not kidding. I share the sentiment with Island XD. The fact that literally every line this man says in this quest has some sort of importance, but importance that we can't really understand because we don't have enough of the picture to see. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to break down what he says and present possible theories and meanings of every line that he says. And then afterwards, just kind of synthesize what we learned. So let's understand this quest to the most minute of details. Let's go! Alright, so the first thing I want to cover, and the first thing I did when I was playing this quest, is just point out that yes, Dane does not have a vision. It is nowhere to be seen on his person. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a vision, or even a delusion. But because of the nature of Dane, I doubt that either of those are true. But if either of them are true, it's more likely to be that he has a delusion. So now that that's out of the way, let's do the insane breakdown of literally everything this man says. And when I say everything, I mean everything. When going into this quest, I wasn't expecting Dane to talk like he does in the trailers, but who oh boy was I wrong. He speaks in that vague poetic way literally always. And he also speaks in a way that like basically everything he says is of importance. Even when he says literally nothing, it's of importance. So just let me demonstrate. So when we walk up to him, we say we're an adventurer and he says nothing. We say we're an honorary knight of Favonius and he says nothing. But once we utter the word traveler, his interest is piqued. So this means that the term traveler is an interesting word to him. And I think there's a more simple grounded explanation aside from the obvious. Think about this. How many times have you heard the word travel or traveler in the game when not referring to Aether or Lumine? Very few times, right? Well, I think that's because the term traveler isn't a very common term in Teyvat, and instead is replaced with adventurer. I think it's not too far of a stretch to assume that, because the Adventurer's Guild is so widespread across Teyvat, that a traveler is most likely to be a person in the Adventurer's Guild. And if you're in the Guild, you are now an adventurer. And when you introduce yourself to people, you aren't going to introduce yourself as anything but a member as of the Adventurer's Guild, because that's quite prestigious. So the term traveler is going to be quite rare, I think. That might be the reason why the term piques Dane's interest so much. There's also the fact that Lumine is a traveler in the sense that she traveled between worlds, but that's kind of obvious, and I don't think that actually plays a part in Dane's interest in Aether until he says the word sister. See, if we said we're an adventurer, and Dane happened to pay attention to us, and then we said we're looking for our sister, I think that Dane would take that as, oh, it's just a random person I don't know with a sister that I don't know. But I think because we say the words traveler and sibling together, there is a connection that Dane cannot ignore. What's also interesting is that this connection seems to take Dane off guard. When I first finished the quest, my first thought was, did Dane intentionally set this up? Did he come to Mondstadt looking for us? And his reaction when we say sibling, I think that our meeting was more on the coincidental side. If he was meaning for us to meet him, then us showing up at that point in that manner was surprising to him. But then he immediately plays it off and tells us to sit down. So the first thing he says when we sit down is a question about Paimon. Now, another theory that I want to cover is the theory that Dane was the Paimon equivalent for somebody like Lumin or the Unknown God. I kind of think that this is kind of debunked by the fact that Dane is inquiring about Paimon just as much as anybody else in Teyvat would. He doesn't have any sort of tone of familiarity, but instead a tone of curiosity and inquiry. I think that because even Dane isn't familiar with Paimon, that Paimon remains a completely unique creature in Teyvat. Paimon still makes me uneasy because I still don't believe that people see Paimon as just a regular irregularity. I don't know, it just kind of makes me uneasy. But after we say that she's emergency food, because what else would you say? 
they just kind of pass it off, saying it is indeed a good thing to have somebody accompany you on your travels, which even from the beginning you can tell is coming from his own experience. We'll get into that more a little bit later. He then gives us his name, Dainsleaf, which the English VO pronounces as Dainsleaf, which I find really, really weird, and then asks why we're talking to him. We say we want to recruit him, and then he swiftly agrees, but with a price. The way that he says these things make me think that he knew we were going to try and recruit him, and that he had everything that's coming up prepared. I think that with how fast he says, sure, that he knew we were going to ask and he had his answer and his price already set up. I actually think that Dane had a lot of this set up, but to what extent I'm not sure, but we'll talk about that later. Quick side note, I, I want to just note how much of a task this is. Because of how Dane talks, everything he says is like a single brushstroke on a painting. You don't get the full picture until every line, every brushstroke is complete. And that's why talk, talking theories isn't going to be effective until every brushstroke has been covered and analyzed. I just wanted to get that out of there because I will be saying we'll talk about this later a lot in this video. The payment he requires is actually a rather low one, 500 moro, which is like chump change basically, and three answered questions. The questions he answers are thus, paraphrased. Who is the most important factor in cleansing Devon from the influence of the Abyss Order? Who is going to be the one to protect Lee with from any future dangers? And who do the gods look upon more favorably, the ones with or without visions? The answers you can give follow a pattern of sorts. The one that sucks up to the gods, the one that sucks up to the people, or the one that's more neutral and takes the credit of everybody in general. The answer that you give changes how Dane Slave reacts. If you answer two or three questions in either of the first two sides, he will say that you are pretty different from someone else he knows. If you answer two or three in this third way, however, he says that you two are quite similar. Now, there are a lot of things to unpack here, so I'm just going to go step by step. The first thing that I find very strange about this is the scope of knowledge in which Dane Slave has. He knows who Venti truly is, being the Animal Archon, and when questioned about it, uh, he answers in a rather, like, aggressive way, shutting that line of wind query right down where it stands. But on the flip side, he does not know, or at least doesn't seem to know, the stipulations of the contract that was made between Morax and the Tsaritsa. However, he knows that the contract was made, signed, and costed Morax's gnosis, and in turn his godhood. The scope of knowledge in which Dane possesses is hard to tell. Up until this quest, I've been assuming Dane is just entirely omniscient, or all-knowing, because of the fact that he plays the role of narrator in the game's story. And he still does. However, the way in which he words the questions can give one of two impressions. Either he isn't omniscient enough to be able to discern what the terms the Tritza and Morax came to, or he's so omniscient that he knows what we know and do not know, and words his questions thusly. If it is the first case, then that means that Dane basically has the exact same scope of knowledge as we do, which is interesting for multiple theories that are out there. But on the other side, him being extremely omniscient means that the dude literally knows everything about Tevat and the things going on in it, meaning he's extremely powerful in a way we have yet to see in Tevat. Again, I'll touch on these later. Second, the question about visions contrasts against the other questions, because it itself isn't something that applies to the quest we've gone on, but instead is something that applies to the rules of Tevat as a whole. And it's an interesting question, because it's something that we do not and probably cannot know without asking the gods directly, but we still have to form an opinion on it anyways. But it's something that applies to the Traveler all the same, because the Traveler is somebody who exemplifies the third answer. He is the one that holds the grace of the gods, or at least holds the grace of two of them, but doesn't have a vision to show it. I actually think that this idea is strengthened when the camera focuses on the traveler when Dane asks the question. The third thing is that, even though Dane says the questions do not have a right or wrong answer, because of how the responses of the questions are set up, and because he's basically looking for specific answers when he asks them, in practice, they do in fact have a correct answer, which are the neutral answers. And finally, the one y'all are probably waiting for me to cover, the person in which we are being compared against. It's pretty obvious, right? Dane is talking about the other sibling. If you're using Aether, then Dane vaguely speaks of her. If you Lumine, Dane uses him instead. This does a lot to debunk a variety of theories, such as Dane being Aether from the future because the pronouns he should be using really change depending on who he's talking to, uh, and a few other theories. It's not the hardest connection to make, but there's something deeper here that I want to bring up. A lot of people have brought up that these questions are a decent way to get an idea of what Lumine believes about this world. She has a very neutral view of the world, where she thinks that everybody is responsible for major achievements, and one person is not able to defend an entire city. Lumine is somebody who sees the world through a wider lens. In this case, she is the keeper of the picture. She sees everything, and she has a reason for working with the Abyss because of this. While it's not the biggest lore dump, 
it's nice to have at least some sort of idea as to what Lumine is attempting or why she's doing what she's doing. So Dane was doing all of this so he could quote, understand our views of this world. And now he lets us commission him, although only for a commission relating to the Abyss Order. Weird, but okay. Keep this weird vendetta against the Abyss Order in mind, it'll come into play a little bit later. Dane says he's on the trail of an Abyss Herald, a creature we haven't heard of, but is definitely finished, guys. Don't worry, this quest definitely wasn't just to teach content that is the finish at all. No, not at all. No, no, no. We have no clue what they might look like, though, as Dane just kind of dodges those questions, which is sus in and of itself. And again, I'll get into that later, but that's his own theory. The Traveler then brings up the fact that we haven't seen a whole lot of the Abyss since we got them off the back of the Devalin, which is definitely something I didn't really think about until Paimon talks about it. And apparently that's no fault of our own, and is actually something that the Abyss Order was planning. This is actually one of the bigger reveals when it comes to this, because that implies that the Abyss Order are much, much more involved in the background of everything than the Fatui could even wish to be. So they are way more influential than we ever thought them to be. The Abyss is seemingly going to be the big baddie of this game, even though the Abyss seemingly wants us to think that it's actually the Fatui. And it makes sense, we did a pretty good job of rating the Abyss Order from Mondstadt, and then suddenly they just disappear. So how else are they going to do their chaotic plans without having us involved? Frame another power as the bad guys, and then disappear out of the sight of the person that can defeat you. But how did the Abyss know who we are, and how did they know about our attempts to stop the Abyss? Well, I think the key to this is in the We Will Be Reunited trailer. In this trailer, Lumine is shown wandering around Tevat in the hand of a ruin guard until she runs into a Abyss Mage, who calls her Her Highness, and the reports that her brother is there stopping the plans related to Devalin. In my video where I play through the quest, I mistakenly thought that this trailer happens concurrently to the Dane Slave quest, when in reality this trailer actually takes place concurrently with the much earlier part of the game where we're doing the Devalin quest. A very similar thing happens with Ailer sensing Lumine on the cliff, and he passes it off as nothing. So how does this make connections to what we have? Well, it makes a few. This shows us that Lumine, somehow and for some reason, is a higher ranking being within the Abyss Order, capable of commanding Abyss Mages, so much so that she's called Your Highness. You might be able to even argue that she's an Abyss Herald, but I don't think there's enough evidence to argue for or against that. However, I will touch on that theory a little bit later. On top of this, because of that Hydro Abyss Mage in the trailer, Lumine knows that her brother is back, and he's defying what the Abyss Order is trying to do. My theory here is that Lumine is the person that is giving the orders to divert the attention of Aether and his gang, and using the Fatui as that distraction so they can do something in the background. She's really the only person who's capable of this. She's the one that learned of her brother, and she knows how powerful her, br her brother can be, so she's the one that's going to give the orders to pull some strings and divert the attention of Aether. So now Dane makes another vague mention of her and how our confidence is just like hers, and wait, that makes sense because we're their twin, and then we're off to the Temple of the Falcon. When we arrive at the Temple of the Falcon, the first thing Dane says is that this temple, quote, does bear some marks of the Abyss. What these marks are is unclear. It could be any of the many things that appear on the door of the domain, but it could also be something that we can't see or sense, but Dane can. Then Dane throws this intensely vague line of, The Falcon of the West, though it can soar in the wind, it ultimately does not but hover under the light of the gods. So what does that mean? Well, for those that forget everything that happened at the beginning of the game, which includes me, I actually had to look it up, you might completely forget who the Falcon of the West is. I don't blame you. The Falcon of the West is one of the four winds of Mondstadt, who are kind of the guardian of the nations of sort. Think of Mondstadt's version of the Adepti. The four winds are Andreas, the Wolf of the North, Jean, the Lion of the South, the Volan, the Dragon of the East, but no longer is considered a, a, a one of the four winds, and Vanessa, the Falcon of the West. Vanessa is supposedly long dead, but her legacy continues as Mondstadt's Falcon of the West, a title which she achieved after her death and ascension to Celestia. So long answer short, the Falcon of the West is Vanessa. For those that are interested in deeper telling the story but are too lazy to read, Facepalm did a really, really good reading of her in-game literature. His voice is like amazing, so just go check it out. So let's go over Dane's line again. He says the Falcon of the West can soar in the wind, but it ultimately does nothing except hover under the light of the gods. While he says this rather poetically, it isn't that hard to understand once you know who the Falcon of the West is. It's basically saying that Vanessa has the power to soar and be much more than just a servant of the gods, but instead she just does just that. She just serves the gods and nothing more. What soaring in the wind could actually entail is unclear. So this could have importance because of what it could imply. This could be implying that Dane believes that Vanessa could be doing so much more than just doing what the gods desire. 
I think that it's reasonable to think that Dane sees the influence of the gods as artificial or limiting, when beings such as Vanessa could be doing so much more with the power they've obtained because of their legacy. We know that Dane doesn't really like the gods, or at least is on more of a neutral side to them, so it would make sense that he believes that a being that has so much potential is being limited by the gods. What's also interesting is the fact that he says the light of the gods, which is an interesting word choice. I'm probably reading into this way too much at this point, but the fact that he uses the word light, which has a rather positive connotation, instead of something like influence or control or something of the like, just kind of reinforces the neutral stance towards the gods he presents to us. This neutrality is going to become much more relevant when we get to the end of the temple, but it's good to point out that his position in this world seems to be rather unclear. Once we enter the temple, Dane's first line is, the scent of the abyss is getting stronger, it's not far now. Keep this line in the back of your mind, we'll come back to it later. Paimon then asks what a herald looks like, and Dane dodges the question again, saying that if we see one, then it'll save him the explanation, instead of him just giving us a briefing as to what to expect if we do run into one. So we fight a few abyss mages, then we get to talk with Dane, where we get to unpack a few of those come back to it later points I've stored away. Let's hear what he has to say first. Just a few abyss mages? Seems like that herald might have already left. The abyss. It is chaos, and it is also destruction. It is a morass of inconceivable madness that encroaches upon this world's very foundations. That is why even the Dragon of the East, a servant of a deity, was unable to resist its corrosive powers. And the creatures of the Abyss desire nothing less than the overthrow of a world ruled by the Archons. You seem to know a lot about the Abyss, Dane. <laughs> well, we do have some history. So we asked him to tell us more about the Abyss Order, and he dumps a plethora of adjectives that describe the Abyss as basically the opposite of order. And with the tone he speaks this line with, we can tell that Dane does nothing except despise the Abyss, and only wishes to oppose the Abyss in any way he can. But why? Well, we have a vague understanding. Dane says that the Abyss encroaches upon this world's very foundations with an unconceivable madness. Meaning that, for one reason or another, Dane is trying to prevent the Abyss from destroying the foundations of the world. He's doing something to protect Tevat, although his motives aren't clear. It could be that Dane doesn't wish to necessarily save Tevat, but instead opposes the Abyss Order for his own sake, or the sake of somebody else. I think that this is a rather sound theory, as Dane definitely doesn't seem the kind of person that has the heart to save the entire world like Diluc or the Traveler, but instead is the kind of person to serve revenge or do something out of regret or opposition. I think that for some reason in the past, the Abyss did something to Dane, his home or his loved ones, and now he seeks to rival the Abyss. But that's like a big shot in the dark. I think the whole saving Tevat as a whole thing is just a byproduct of opposing the Abyss. He has a history that motivates him to oppose the Abyss with every bit of his soul, but that's just speculation. We don't have any real indicators as to what Dane's real motivations are. I'm just basing this off of hunches that the character gives me. So moving on from that side tangent, he says that the Abyss desires nothing but to overthrow the Archons. This gives us a few things. One, the fact that the Abyss seeks to strictly oppose the gods. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good nugget of info. But it, it brings us some interesting questions which I brought up in the stream. If he's against the Abyss, then is he with the gods or is he just kind of like a neutral party? Well, as I was saying earlier, I think he is on his own neutral party, just like D. Luke is his own neutral party in Mondstadt. I don't think Dane despises the gods as he uses no negative wording when referring to them, or at least in this quest, especially compared to the kind of languages he used when talking about the Abyss Order. So that heavily implies that Dane has nothing against the gods in any strict sense, but instead thinks of them as just kind of there, ruling this world as they are meant to, and nothing more. So after that little ditty in the temple, he drags us to Wolvendom, which is the most random location to go on for a goose chase for an abyss creature that doesn't exist in the game yet, uh, but whatever. So let's go to Wolvendom. So the scenery that Dainsleaf chooses just right off the bat, choosing to go to Wolvendom of all places, and to go see Boreas, one of the Four Winds, when we are just at a temple of another of the Four Winds, is kind of intriguing at best, but I'll, pa I'll pass that off for now. Also, uh, just a weird side note, has anybody else noticed that Andreas isn't even in the north and should be more the Great Wolf King of the West? He's not even that north compared to where Devalon resided, and he's not even that north in relation to Mossad, he's just like directly west. I, I don't know, it's just a weird thought. 
So Dane's first lines here imply that he knows something of Andreas, but has not actually met him. I don't think that there's much that's shady here. I just think that him and this traveling partner of his came by the lair of the wolf, but didn't meet Andreas because he didn't have a reason to come out. If you notice on the walls of the side of the arena look a lot like hieroglyphics telling a story of some sort. So I can imagine Dane and his partner went on a bit of an archaeological excursion to look at the stories carved into the lair of the wolf. I don't think there's a whole lot more to it. Although Dane does say that his partner wanted to hear the story of the wolf specifically. Although that might only imply a hope to hear, but only to not have the luck to actually meet Andreas. I don't know, it's a weird choice of words. Dane then says that the wolf is sharp of fang and keen of claw, and yet dwelling here only. So what is he trying to insinuate there? Well, when Dane says sharp of fang and keen of claw, he's listing two things that might make a good wolf a good hunter. Sharp teeth for killing, and in a more metaphorical sense, a keen claw, which might mean a claw that is smart and lithe, knowing when to pounce only when at the best of times. But instead of using those claws and those fangs, the wolf decides only to dwell in the safety of his lair. Which is an interesting point. Why does the wolf only dwell there in that area? Is he like an adeptus only serving to protect the monster when needed? Or has he just completely strayed from his duties as one of the four winds and only looks over his kingdom of wolf in them? Either way, he practically hides away in his lair, not coming out, and Dane is implying that he does it for a specific reason. After that, this part of the quest actually isn't really that interesting. We learn a bit about what the purple circle of runes is, which is to say it's an abyssal spell. Uh, we fight some abyss mages, and boom, we're off talking to Dane again with some disappointing news that there is no herald. There isn't really much to say about the end of this part of the quest. It really just serves as a transition between this part, which is rather uninteresting, in its entirety, and to the more important climax at Old Mondstadt. Even the comments about Andreas and his territorial nature aren't really that interesting because, you know, it's a wolf. What do you expect from a wolf? I'm not gonna expect southern hospitality from any wolf, much less the king of wolves. There was a bit in this, uh, in this part of the video, or there was going to be a bit in this part of the video about the gender of the traveling partner being only discernible through the grammar of other languages like French, but that was cut because this was proven by another part, which we'll get into in the, in, into the next part. So after struggling with the game's cameras to take a dope-ass photo, we get to the real juicy stuff at Storm Terror's Lair. So Dane says that he heard about what happened to you during the crisis at the beginning of the game, which is either him using carefully chosen set of words to protect his actual scope of knowledge, or, more interestingly, is implying that he has been inquiring about the events of the game so far. He seems to have to research and follow our trail through rumors, and that he's not entirely omniscient. However, again, I don't trust Dane with a single bone in my body, so this could just be trusting the word, not the spirit, way too much. Continuing on with that, I actually want to point out his continued use of weasel words and phrases when talking about Old Mondstadt, if my memory serves and the like. It's like he's trying to make sure that the Traveler thinks that he did not experience any of it, but he actually slips up here, which is our first huge drop since the beginning of the quest. It's the first time I laid eyes upon the ruins of Old Mondstadt, the Dragon of the East had yet to fall, much less come to nest in this place. You laid eyes on Mondstadt before Devalon fell, you say? This is such a big slip up that even Paimon picks up on it, pointing out that Devon fell way too long before Dane was even reasonably able to see it. But Dane just passes it off by saying, don't think too much about it, and then moves on. You could have at least put a little bit more effort into it, Dane. Come on, dude. <laughs> but there's a little bit more to it. I pointed this out in the stream, but this goes to show that it is possible to live for multiple hundreds of years in some form or fashion. Because somehow Dane had laid eyes upon Old Mondstadt before Storm Terror was even corrupted by the Abyss. So this kind of puts me in a place with my point about Ryan uh, that I brought up in my Abedo video, where it might actually be possible to live long enough to birth a dragon and then create another creature, this time humanoid, after the, the death of that dragon. So there is the possibility that Ryan Dodder is actually extremely old and evading death. How that's actually happening, though, is yet to be proven, though. So Dane points out the light actuators and how the Abyss Order wouldn't neglect those things, meaning that Dane is actually familiar with them, which I'm not sure what that means, uh, but at best it probably means that he's more familiar with the old Mondstadt than he appears to be. And then we go find the light actuator. Dane goes on to explain that heralds are quite horrific things, not only in power, but also in appearance, as he says, having to gaze upon such a creature is what is so horrible about them. But he also says, I do believe that you will come across one eventually, which, yeah, is basically me how he was saying, yeah, it's copy, don't worry. He also says that it would be great if you could just go around your problems, which 
seems both like foreshadowing and something coming from experience. When asked about it, Dane confirms that yes, he wants to travel with that tra traveling companion of his. This traveling companion, which we have not heard the gender of until he uses the pronoun she, which also changes depending on who the MC is confirming the traveling companion was the sibling, vaguely says that she no longer travels, which might mean a few things. Either Dane is, again, lying, being weaselly, or genuinely believes that she does not travel for a variety of reasons. Everything that the line, she no longer travels, could be implying lies in one of two situations. Dane either does or does not know that Lumine is affiliated with the Abyss Order now. If he does know, then that means the term does not travel can be a few meanings. Travel in and of itself could mean multiple things depending on how you want to interpret it. In this situation, it could simply mean that to no longer travel means you just kind of got fed up with it and settled down somewhere nice and similar with a margarita in hand. It could also mean that you no longer travel because you died, or it could be that you no longer travel in the sense of exploring the world because you want to, but instead travel the world for another reason. In the other case, it could mean that Dane genuinely believes that she does not travel anymore, and while I don't think this is the case at all, I still think that it's good to bring up for posterity or whatever. With how he describes it, he seems to be trying to imply that his traveling companion no longer travels because she got tired of it and tried to settle down somewhere. However, that's not directly stated. What is stated is that Dane himself wants to settle down at some point after finishing his unfinished business. Dane says he'll venture back home after he's done with his unfinished business, then Paimon talks about settling down once we find her sister, which I honestly think is wholesome as fuck, and then Dane suddenly laments about having a home for a few seconds and then says that we'll have time after we're done traveling, and then gets cut off. Well, it won't be too late to think about where you stay once your journey reaches its end. While you're still traveling, you should... We know what this means. This happened before when we were fighting Storm Terror, and this is a very reminiscent of what happens in the We Will Be Reunited trailer. This means that Lumine was there, but she evaded our vision. Only, was she there at the moment? Later, we see that the Ruin Guard footprints she left behind were at Storm Terror's lair the first time we were there. And there's no sign of her being there a second time, so how do we sense her? Well, the answer lies, as most things in this video, in Dane. He says that we need to go investigate the cliff so we can see it for ourselves and thus see clearly, which seems redundant, but whatever, and so we do. Once we get to the top of the cliff, Dane asks if we can still feel that familiar feeling, but the way in which he says it seems like he's implying something. It's like he's implying that he knows what kind of feeling Aether is getting and is checking if we're on the right track. Aether says it's nearby and then there's some chit chat and we're actually going to skip over that for the sake of this point. And then Dane says perhaps the dandelion bears some sort of scent that only you recognize. Right, so here's another we'll come back to this later that we're pulling out of the bag. This time with the continued use of the term scent. Dane uses this term when talking about the abyss sort of in the herald he's tracking and he uses it when he's talking about the way Aether senses Lumine. This might just be me being paranoid or looking for patterns that aren't there, but I just find this use of the word scent and smelling when we also stop by a layer of an overgrown dog a little strange. I have no clue how this might connect to anything, but I, I just find it an extremely strange detail that just stands out. Anyways, back to talking to that chit chat that I skipped over, Dane says that nothing looks any different from the last time he was here, which we inquire about. Dane passes out the question in a rather uncomfortable way, saying that he, it was his traveling companion that brought him here. Then Paimon asks a pretty interesting question. She asks Dane what his favorite place is, and the response we get in a normal circumstance would make me think, nah, this man is lying. But because of travail in the last line that Dane speaks, we know that this really probably isn't him lying to dodge the question. He genuinely does not have as good of a memory as he once did. Meaning that he probably has lived as long as is implied. He has lived that long and therefore cannot remember everything. Dane then notices the Ruin Guard footprint in the stone, which is a sign of Lumine, as she was riding the Ruin Guard in the trailer and follows it back to a dandelion, which has the scent of Lumine on it. We then have a flashback, which we've seen a few times, and then we say that we can sense her because of the dandelion. The line about the ascent occurs, and he poses the question of, has the dandelion perhaps experienced something related to you? Believe it or not, we actually know what this dandelion has experienced. There is a very, very, very high chance that this is the same dandelion we see Lumine crush with her boot in the We Will Be Reunited trailer. 
meaning that Lumine has done something to this dandelion to leave her scent on it in some form or another, however creepy that sounds. So this dandelion has experienced some sort of needless abuse. So between the dandelion and Aether, where do they share a similar experience? Well, the unknown god separating Lumine from Aether is a needless abuse, from our eyes at least, but from the eyes of somebody else might seem necessary or reasonable. And while this connection is a bit of a stretch, note that Dane says similar and not exactly the same. So I think the connection of needless abuse is the most that we need. Or a stronger connection is the scent connects Aether to somebody who has had ex a similar experience to him through the dandelion as a proxy. In that case, the person he's connecting to is Lumine, who had a practically identical experience to Aether. Dane then spits some iro ass wisdom on us and then tells us to think rationally and slowly and not with anxiety and vexation, which is reasonable. And then he says that she is still on this world, which is also a reasonable line of reasoning. There is no need to rush, as she is still here. Although the fact that he jumped to that conclusion further supports the fact that he knows her and knows that she's still here. Then he says that the most important thing now is not finding her, but the journey to find her, which I really don't agree with for in the point of view of Aether, but for the player, yeah, definitely. Which is something that I kind of just realized. Like, at times, Dane seems like he's not talking to Aether, but instead talking through Aether directly to the player. There are times where he says things that go straight over Paimon and Aether's heads, but is something that the player should very easily be able to understand. There are also some lines such as this one that makes sense when in context of the player, but not in the context of Aether. Aether would much rather save the seven chapters of the game that takes multiple years to complete and just run away with Paimon and his sister, but the players of Genshin Impact are here for the journey, and the day that Aether runs away with Paimon and his sister is the day that Genshin ends and is the day where a very large player base is sad. So it's slightly suspicious. The next line isn't really important, although Dane does use the term at kin to refer to Aether's sister, which is a word we've only really seen or heard one other place in reference to Albedo and Ryan Daughter, but that's a stretch and a half. Dane then says that we should part ways here, and says that we will meet again, with no doubt in his voice towards that statement. Then he says, After all, I did take 500 mora and those three answers you gave me. Then he walks off. I honestly think there should be way more of a discussion towards what this final line means. I've seen a few ideas thrown here and there, but nothing really worthwhile has been pointed out or thrown out, as far as I know. The importance of 500 more and three answers has some connection to seeing Dan's life again, and I feel like the fact that we paid him these things has an importance that's going to bite us in the ass later. So I think a healthy amount of theorizing in the comments below for this line should be something y'all should do. Mostly because I have actually no clue where to start with that line. And I'm also 7,000 words into the script at this point, so with the entirety of the quest summarized, let's dive into some theories that popped up because of this and cover some of those we'll talk about at later points. So that's the entirety of the Dane's Life quest. There's a lot of questions in here that have yet to be answered, some of which are not answerable, some of which are while not answerable per se, are definitely in the range of understanding enough to at least be discussable. So let's discuss some of the stuff that we can. I think the first thing that I want to go over is what Dane does and does not know. Up until now, I was under the impression that Dane's Leaf was entirely omniscient, or all-knowing in every facet, and acts as the narrator of the story. And when I say narrator, I literally mean he's the person that is aware that Genshin is a story, and he is the one telling the story to the audience, either during or after the events of the game. In other words, he's the most important person in this entire story. So now that we know that he knows some things and does no not or is choosing not to share some things, changes that view in a few ways. I personally think that Dane knows way more than he lets on, which makes him even more powerful than we previously thought. But him having a more limited scope makes things I think even more interesting because that means that he shares an identical view of Teva as a traveler. And if that's the case, then that does a lot to support the Dane is Aether in X way because that means that if there is a strong connection between them in the shape of the scope of what they know, then the only logical connection between that point is that they are the same person. If you really want to stretch it, Dane being all-knowing could also support the theory that Dane is Aether from the future or whatever as well, as he is seemingly choosing not to share certain things, such as the terms in which Morax and the Tritsreeds agreed on, things that he would know after already being completed with his journey. This is a very reasonable line of thought, but I don't really think that this is the case for a few reasons. 
I really think that Dane is Aether from the future theory is proved to be moot here because of the whole pronoun thing. The pronoun discussion has been talked about to death, so I won't spend too long on it, but I'll still cover it because it's a good thing to cover. So yes, Dane changes pronouns based off who the player chooses as the main character. This in its entirety confirmed that Dane has some sort of relation to the sibling as there would be no other reason for Dane to switch pronouns. And while I don't think that this entirely confirms that the her mentioned in Travail is Lumine, it adds an extra layer towards that theory. The only reason why I don't think that this entirely confirms the con connection between her and the trailer in Lumine is because there is no other strong connection between the two girls that Dane is talking about, other than his vague mentioning of them. I will believe that Travail's her and Lumine are the same person when Dane says something about the flowers or makes another connection to Travail's her when referring to Lumine. This is one of those things where I could be jumping to conclusions, but over the week and a bit of working on the script, I think there's more merit to holding off on jumping to conclusions. So while in the video where I first played the quest, I jumped to the conclusion that the her and is the same as the her and Travail, I no longer think that this is 100% confirmed to be the case. Without a mention of flowers or something along those lines, I do not think that there is a connection yet. The operational word there is yet. But back to the Dane theory. The theory states that Dane is Aether from the future and has learned how to manipulate time just going back in time or something. I think it's a far-fetched theory just by itself, but I think that whatever merit that the theory held is kind of debunked here. Because every mention of her is in fact Lumine during the quest, that means that Lumine was the person that Dane was following around on journeys. And because of the gender swap thing, with who you pick as MC, Dane's gender would also have to be swapped for everything to make sense. Because there would be no reason for future Aether to go back in time to help his sister based off of the very little we know about his most motivations. A quick thing I'd like to touch on, but not really elaborate much on, is the actual location of the quest. It's a strange pattern that we go to each of the locations of the Four Winds, Mondstadt proper for Jean, the Temple of Falcon for Vanessa, Wolvendom for Andreas, and Storm Terror's Lair for Storm Terror. I don't know what this deal detail could mean if it means anything. Uh, I don't know. It's just could be me reading way too much into things, but it's a little detail I noticed. The final thing I really, really want to touch on is the idea that this entire quest was set up by Dane. This theory I haven't seen as of writing the script, so I don't know if it's actually been brought up at all in a substantial way, so I'm just going to cover it here. The entire reason I say this is because Dane's actions seem so scripted, aside from the fact that this is a game where everything is scripted. What makes me think this is that those last lines of the quest where he says that he knows we'll meet again and that he took 500 mora in those three answers for a reason. My thinking here is that the 500 mora in those three questions are binding in some way. In what way is unclear and Dane had the intention of binding us, Lumine's brother specifically, for a reason. And I think he came to Monsta intentionally to find us. That's just why he shows up all of a sudden. He's looking for us to ask us these questions. The only thing that I think that could kind of debunk this line of thought is the fact that he's surprised when we approach him. But I think the only reason why he's surprised when we say Traveler and Sister is because he probably wasn't expect us to approach him, but instead the other way around. I think it was kind of just a case of, well, that was easy surprise, because from then on, he just kind of goes with it, asking us questions and really freakishly quickly agreeing to a commission. So Dane knew what he was doing from the start. What makes me think this even further is the fact that it's a completely wild coincidence that he takes us to where our sister was at one point, a place that bears the scent of her and the sign of a ruin guard. It just seems so strange that he brings us there and then foreshadows things in the future. It just seems like way too much of a coincidence for it to just not be planned. After that, I think the last thing that there is to talk about is his stance against powers in this world. The thing with Dane is that, from as far as we know, he stands on his own independent party in the middle of the three other powers in this world. He stands with the gods because he despises the abyss. He stands partly with the abyss because one, he knows Lumine, and two, he doesn't have the best impression of the gods, as we can tell from his line in the Travail trailer. And because of that, he also stands with Snezhnaya and the Tsaritsa. But he doesn't entirely agree with every party either. He despises the Abyss for the chaos that they bring, he doesn't like the gods because he thinks that everybody is capable of living without the oversight of the gods, and he doesn't stand with the Tsaritsa because she is a god and she's a god trying to do what Dane thinks is right. But this doesn't mean that Dane is entirely neutral or complacent. Dane has things that he wants to achieve and has motivations to achieve them. The first step towards that is ridding Tevat of the Abyss Order. What his goals are are unclear, but he still has goals that he's achieving, so he almost is creating his own party. 
so instead of three major powers in Teyvat with their own goals consisting of the gods, the treats, and the abyss order, we now have four major powers with four major goals consisting of the gods, the Tsaritsa, the abyss order, and Dane, where Dane is somewhere in between the four. Right, thank y'all for watching. Uh, I'm sorry this one took so long to come out. One, it was just a long ass video, and two, um, we were in the middle of getting ready to sell our house, so that, uh, yeah, that added a bit of time to the to the production. Um, it, yeah, I, I just couldn't make videos and couldn't record and just didn't have the time to edit for a while there. So um, that's why this one took out took so long to get out. A, I'm also sorry for this being very scatterbrained and being very like stop and go. It's, there's just a lot to talk about and I didn't really have any better ideas for a better structure. So yeah, on the front of future content, uh, we're in the, we can stay in our house for a few more months. So content should stay the same um, until about May. And then once we move out, we have to have like a three month ish buffer in a, an apartment while we wait for our house to be finished, our new house. And so in between that three month period, I'm going to um, use a backlog of content that I'm trying to collect right now to release so I have at least something to release during those three months so I'm not completely silent during then. So uh, here until May, I sh my content should be the same until then, but I'm going to start releasing some more gameplay content here soon. Um, and that gameplay content is going to carry over into the three, four month period where I am in an apartment and can't really make or can't really record videos. I'll be able to edit just fine, but it's the recording that's going to be a problem. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying right now. I'm just trying to backlog videos and also school is a bitch. So if my uploading of these kinds of videos slows down, that's why because school is horrible and I'm trying to backlog stuff. So um, once I get this video out, that is going to be when I start recording stuff. I already have a few videos recorded. One video um, is me playing Honkai. I actually had two, but the second episode, like OBS just went kaput and just decided not to record the video. I don't know what happened. I pressed stop recording and it just didn't save to my drive. So I don't know what happened there. But I have a few stupid videos with my friends. I'm planning on recording more. Um, I'm planning on recording more Honkai, more of an, some other games, just as variety content, just to have so I can actually put it out during my silence. So yeah, that's the plan. That's kind of the roadmap. I'll elaborate on. I'll I'll elaborate on it a little bit more later at a later date. I don't know when that's going to be, but yeah, I might just make an update video before I go silent. Uh, but yeah, that's the plan. So yeah, uh, thank y'all so much for watching and listening to me rant, and I'll see you guys in the next video. So see ya.